Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Equay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Tonight, my good friend Sophia Smallstorm returns to the show. The conversation with Sophia is centered around her recent newsletter called the Avatar Update. In that newsletter, she shares her research and insights into a very debilitating injury known as rhabdomyolysis, which can be brought on by extreme exercise and statin drugs. Rhabdo is when the cells and the muscles explode and are left damaged and dying. Rhabdo affects the entire body and in some cases can lead to death. People who engage in extreme or very intense exercise programs, many of which are offered at fitness centers across the country, run the risk of incurring rhabdo. And as we discuss in this show, it's not an injury that should be taken lightly. The discussion with Sophia is wide-ranging and insightful as always. And to kick the conversation off, I asked Sophia to explain rhabdomyolysis. And here is what she had to say. So I was wondering if you can give the audience some background and tell them what exactly is rhabdomyolysis. Well, let's just start with exercise, all right? Um, In the old days, exercise used to be playing tennis, jogging, doing a sport. And then later on, people took up walking, power walking, running even, and, and we had all the 10Ks and everything. But now there's been a trend toward what's called uh, cross training. Are you familiar with that? Yes. People like to combine different kinds of exercise to fully develop. uh, The new word is functionality. There is strength, fitness, coordination, functionality in different muscle groups and in different um, parts of their body. And I guess this is popularized also by the triathlon that you were considered a truly fit athlete if you could do swim, bike, and run, and all at the same time, even in a competition. So there has been an explosion of a new gym in the world. There are about 3,000 in the world and 332 in California alone, and they're called CrossFit. Uh, So you drive around, and I bet you people listening are going to see in their mind's eye, yes, I've seen CrossFit, and CrossFits are popping up everywhere. So CrossFit, the gym, is the brainchild of a guy called Greg Glassman. Greg Glassman was from the San Fernando Valley, uh, Woodland Hills, and he grew up the son of a rocket scientist, and he also had polio as a child. So he was very self-conscious. He used a walker, um, but he had a tremendous will and determination and still does. And he developed in his gym, he had very a good upper body strength. So he was a gymnast. He was able to do upper body lifts and pulls. He was called a ring man in his youth. And he developed a mix of different kinds of training which became the precursor to CrossFit. So he had his program online and it drew the attention of a lot of adherents. It was a very extreme program and he eventually developed and opened his own gyms and he sells those franchises now. So I think CrossFit receives something on the order of 150 franchise applications every month. It is an exercise explosion. And it specializes in teaching people how to push their bodies to the limit and even past the limit. You know, when Jane Fonda uh, began to do her workouts, she would talk about the burn. Yes. Well, personal trainers also have encouraged us to feel the burn. The burn is your muscles telling you that they can't rely on oxygen what's called respiration. They're not making their energy in the nucleus anymore using oxygen-based metabolism. They are reverting to fermentation. They're making their energy in the cytoplasm of the muscle cells and they're using sugar. And that produces lactic acid, which is what you get this burn from. So when your muscles say burn, 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 they are now moving into sugar reliance. And it's a non-aerobic, it's anaerobic energy. And it means you are really pushing your limit because you can't do anaerobic energy for very long. The cells, that's a throwback. The cells have retained their ability to make 
energy from sugar, from, it said, uh, millennia, millions of years ago when we were life forms on this planet that didn't even exist with oxygen. There was no oxygen then. So anyway, to get back to CrossFit, CrossFit specializes and encourages partner training. That means you and I go to the gym together. Usually the partner is the same gender, but let's just say you and I go together and let's say we're well matched physically. So I will do, we're doing push-ups, and I will do a set of 10 or 20, you will do a set of 10 or 20, whatever our re regimen is for the day. And then I'll do a set, you'll do a set. I'll do a set, you'll do a set. And we might transfer to pull-ups. We're still using that same muscle group. I do a set, you do a set. And so we continue, and we get a little bit of a reprieve while the other person is doing the set, but we're really competing against one another. We're working out together, but there's a kind of competition going. And neither one wants to be the loser, right? So the best it can come out is that we end up even. I do a set to match the last you set, set you did, and then we quit. Imagine if you and I aren't a good physical match, and you're much stronger than I am. And I just keep going and going and going because I don't want to be the loser. I can push my body into a state called rhabdo rhabdomyolysis. It's often incorrectly pronounced rhabdomyolysis, but when you look at the structure of the word, it's Y-S-I-S, -S, like paralysis, and not like crisis, I-S-I-S. -S. But it does incorporate a little crisis, or a big crisis, and paralysis eventually. So what happens is, when you reach the point of complete tanking out, your muscle cells just die. They die on the spot. They've gone through all of their stages of different ways of making energy, which are very interesting when you start researching rhabdomyolysis. And you end up with absolutely nothing left. That muscle group will just flat out die. So a lot of people who go to CrossFit will end up going home and plunging in a bath of ice water. This is how they revive themselves and treat the intense soreness and pain that they have. Lactic acid being one of the things coursing through their body because they have gone into the fermentation cycle of energy production during their workout. They need a day or two off after the workout. But in certain cases, people have developed this condition called rhabdomyolysis. Coming back from this extreme workout, they find they can't lift their arms to brush their teeth their arms are if it's the arms they're puffed up the muscle gets very puffed up and it's in extreme inflammation and there's all kinds of fluids there's a condition caused by rhabdomyolysis where the cell wall is just completely broken down and all the myoglobin which is the protein in the muscle cell goes rushing into the bloodstream and it's very dangerous to have myoglobin in the blood that then has to be filtered out by the kidneys myoglobin is harmful to the tubules of the kidneys and the kidneys produce an enzyme called um uh, actually it's a muscle enzyme creatine kinase ck that enzyme will show up in your urine when you have all this myoglobin flowing out of the muscle cells and into the kidneys, which can't remove it. So that's the test they run for a person who has rhabdomyolysis. They will do a urine test, and if they find high levels of CK, creatine kinase, in the urine, the, and your urine is often very, very dark, it's the color of coffee or Coca-Cola, and then you'll end up in this state of complete loss of function in that muscle group, or you die. A lot of people are put in the ICU and they are intubated. They get on dialysis machines to help their kidneys filter this CK out. It can often be the end. So CrossFit Gym has taken as its mascot large rubber figure. Uh, it's also drawn in cartoons called Pukey the clown or Uncle Rabdo the clown. In the full version of the mascot illustration, Uncle Rabdo is surrounded by a pool of blood on the floor at his feet. He's a very muscular clown, you can look him up. And he has um, 
his gut spilled on the floor. Sometimes there's a kidney on the floor. He's hooked up to a dialysis machine. And CrossFit claims that it's actually disclosing this is a danger by using this as its mascot. Oh, that's ridiculous. I mean, they think that they're off the hook because they put this mascot out there. And, um, you know, most people, the vast majority of folks that are involved in this kind of training have no idea whatsoever what rhabdomyolysis could mean. It could ruin their life, completely ruin their life. From what I'm hearing, Sophia, the way you're explaining this is if you do end up getting rhabdomyolysis, that you may not get your muscle back, right? Right. You may end up with weakness and you you end up with, you know, if you survive, not everybody survives, you have this jelly in place of the muscle that you lost. You have very flabby area there and you can't do a lot of work. Those muscles, they just aren't, they're not working anymore. The cells literally get to the point of death, sudden death, you could call it. Well, it appears that they're advocating and marketing a very, very dangerous activity. I don't know what people think they're going to get out of it. I mean, to be honest with you, if I had gone to a gym someplace and their mascot was a clown that was defecating on itself and had bodily organs and whatever hanging out on a dialysis machine, <laughs> I probably wouldn't sign up for that gym. Well, you know, Glassman told the New York Times that CrossFit workouts can kill you. If you find the notion of falling off the rings and breaking your neck foreign to you, then we don't want you in our ranks. And the ranks of CrossFit adherents are people who are really dedicated fitness freaks. They are not quitters. They pride themselves on being extreme exercise enthusiasts. They will go to the point that they might even brag that they survived rhabdo. I don't know. I mean, I'm not casting judgment on any of this because I have pushed myself to extremes in my own life. And in fact, I ran a marathon without adequate training. I did a couple of long runs beforehand and I actually had to work the day before the mar marathon and I ate one bagel. Uh, that was it. I was in New York working um, in the marathon environment and that's all I had time to eat the day before running 26 miles and I'll tell you something after that marathon I went to the bathroom I saw in the toilet pee that was the color of coffee and I thought it was from dehydration yeah I thought my god I just got really dehydrated running so much but it was rhabdo and it comes from marathon running as well. I mean, there are a lot of conditions that can produce rhabdomyolysis, including the extreme exercise. For instance, when you have crush uh, syndrome, if you're trapped under earthquake debris or a car or a bus, you're in an auto accident and you're pinned, the muscle cells will crush and the uh, cell membranes will break. They'll be destroyed by the crushing and then you'll have myoglobin just flowing into the bloodstream and you'll have the same issue with the CK and the kidneys. So a lot of people who are in um, crush situations have rhabdomyolysis. Now, another thing that causes rhabdomyolysis, and this is the really interesting part of my newsletter, statin drugs. I had heard when I was discussing rhabdo with a person who's an MD, she just said very offhandedly, you know, statin drugs give you rhabdo. And I said, they do. And I needed to know why. So I started researching it. The other things are high consumption of alcohol, cocaine, amphetamines, drugs like ecstasy, LSD, snake bite, third degree burns, blocked blood vessels, hypothyroidism, heat stroke is listed. A lot of people have what's called myalgia. Myalgia is muscle pain in the medical, in medical ease. And generally you have myalgia when your muscles are fatigued. They are the cells, you know, the tissues could be inflamed. And we're talking here striated muscle. There's two kinds of muscles, the smooth muscle that makes up your organs, like your intestines. And then there's the striated muscle, which is your skeletal muscle. There is an article written by a very brilliant researcher called Stephanie Senna. She's at MIT. She's a biophysicist. And this woman, her work is really supreme. It blows away 
anyone else's that I've ever seen in many subjects. I'm speaking a bit exuberantly here, but she's definitely worth reading. Senef, S-E-N-E-F-F. So she wrote a piece called Statins and Myoglobin, How Muscle Pain and Weakness Progress to Heart, Lung, and Kidney Failure. Apparently, these statin drugs that one out of four people in America are on, and they're even starting to prescribe them for children. And why do we give statins? We give statins to lower the cholesterol in the bloodstream, serum cholesterol, particularly the ratio of HDL and LDL, which are mistakenly termed cholesterol by the medical field, and they are not cholesterol at all. So regardless, let's just focus on cholesterol. Cholesterol, Dr. Senef writes, is a vital nutrient without which mammalian cells cannot survive. And it is inconceivable to me that crippling the body's ability to synthesize cholesterol can ever be a good idea. So um, statin drugs, she says, deplete cholesterol, leading to destabilization of cell membranes from head to toe. The most commonly reported side effects to statin therapy are muscle pain and weakness. And if they are left unchecked, they can progress to this state called rhabdomyolysis and kidney failure. So... People get muscle weakness in the lungs. That leads to breathing difficulties. And in the heart, it leads to heart failure. So, Mike, do you know anyone on statins? I, yeah, I do know people that are on statins, um, family members that are on statin drugs to lower cholesterol. And I have warned friends of mine who are on statins that, number one, it's not a good idea to take them at all. But I even have sent news this newsletter to them saying, would, would you please just read about how statin drugs cause rhabdomyolysis, that this is why you have shortness of breath right now and you're not able to exercise so much. But um, one of the things that statins cut in half, I call them gunners for cholesterol. They're actually like gunners. They'll shoot the cholesterol out of your cell membrane. So cholesterol is a building block of the cell. If you Google cholesterol, you'll learn that it's an integral repair material. It's a molecule made in the liver and it's returned to the liver on a regular basis in its broken down form. Um, in order to be rebuilt by the liver. It's one of those molecules that we recycle in the body. Statins also reduce this coenzyme Q10 called CoQ10. Right. I haven't had, didn't have the space in my newsletter to write a lot about CoQ10, but it's apparently very important. And the heart depends on it to replenish the energy for its contractions, its pumping, which it does. The heart is a tireless part of your body. It doesn't quit. It has to go 24-7. I'm thinking about people that I know that are on statin drugs, trying to get their cholesterol down. And uh, I do know that before we did the show, I did um, see a lot of articles that Dr. Mercola has put up with regard to the dangers of statin drugs. And aside from the rhabdo, I wrote a couple of things down that uh, statin drugs have been directly linked to. And he says that there are over 300 side effects, and they include cognitive loss, neuropathy, anemia, frequent fevers, cataracts, sexual dysfunction, an increase in cancer risk, pancreatic dysfunction, immune system suppression. You mentioned the muscle problems. So it, it's amazing that all of these side effects are out there, yet the doctors will continue to hand the stuff out like they're handing out candy in order to uh, reduce cholesterol levels. And, and one of the things that I read in uh, Dr. Mercola's article, he said that um, if you're taking a statin, you may not even need it because cholesterol is not the cause of heart disease. Yeah, that's now, another, I mean, Mercola has done so much work and we have to remember that Mercola's articles are written by other people. They're in, approved by him and they sometimes contradict each other. I have found that in his newsletters, but I think that's only because the set of people who wrote that one particular article didn't know the in nitty gritty of what was written in a previous article. I'm not faulting him or the Mercola um, hub. I have learned so much from Dr. Mercola's newsletters. But one of the things I want to say about the many symptoms that statins might cause, now this is just me. This is just me theorizing here and I could be wrong. So one of the things I learned from an interview Dr. Mercola did with Dr. Uh, Rosedale, Ron Rosedale, 
It's a fascinating interview. It's not very long, but it's very, very groundbreaking. I mean, it'll shatter your paradigm. Doctors refer to cholesterol levels. They refer to a ratio of HDL to LDL, right? You've heard this? Yes. And they say it's not how much cholesterol you have. It's your ratio of HDL and LDL that really matters. You want a lot of the good cholesterol, HDL, and you want little of the bad cholesterol, LDL. Now, what I learned from that interview, if I can hear correctly, what I learned was that HDL and LDL are not even cholesterol. HDL stands for high density lipoprotein and LDL stands for low density lipoprotein. And in my understanding of what proteins do in the body, they're actually, they are fundaments for repairs. They're like bricks. The cells use proteins. Proteins are structural things that the cells have to employ to rebuild. And proteins are also taxicabs. They are carriers of nutrients. They transport and they build. So the, for instance, the, all, we've all heard of hemoglobin. It's the protein in the blood that is the taxi for oxygen. So hemoglobin transport oxygen throughout the bloodstream. And myoglobin is the protein inside the cell that takes the oxygen from the cell wall where it comes in and takes it right to the nucleus of the cell. Picture the cell like an egg, a broken egg, a fried egg. The um, yolk is the nucleus and the white is the cytoplasm. Now the nucleus is fat-based, the cytoplasm is water-based. So they, the cell needs membranes to keep its two parts distinct. And its two parts have a lot of different functions. So myoglobin is the protein taxi inside the cell that carries oxygen from the cell wall to the nucleus where it is made use of to, for respiration to produce the energy ATP, which is the fuel of the cell. And remember we said earlier that when not enough oxygen is coming in fast enough and the cell is being worked and worked and worked, these are muscle cells I'm talking about, they have to stop trying to make oxygen, to make ATP in the nucleus, and they have to start using sugar in the cytoplasm. HDL and LDL to do is high-density lipoprotein, low-density lipoprotein. The descriptor lipoprotein means it's a protein, HDL. LDL is another protein. They're taxis for the cholesterol to ride on. So the LDL carries the full flush new cholesterol that's been just repacked and remade by the liver over to the cells, wherever they happen to be, and the cells use them to remake themselves, to rebuild and strengthen and fortify. And then the leftover cholesterol, the remnants of the full cholesterol is brought back by AL, sorry, HDL, high density lipoprotein. It's the other taxi. It's like the bus or train to and the bus or train from. So these two LDL and HDL are not cholesterol. They just carry it. Okay. And in my simple mind, I'm just a lay person. I would think that a sick person needs a lot of LDL to carry a lot of cholesterol over to his or her damaged, injured tissues and cells. And a, more cholesterol is being used, so less comes back. So when a drug changes the fleet of taxi cabs, the size of the fleet, and it gives you a very small fleet to take the repair material over to the cells and a big fleet to bring it back, this is backwards. The reason people have lots of LDL in their blood and less HDL is because they're sick. It's carrying a bunch of cholesterol. So why would you want to mess with that? And if you do mess with that, and if you change the size, the relative size of those two taxi fleets, you are gonna get innumerable symptoms of disrepair all over the body. Right, now everything you're saying, it maps to um, a couple of the articles that I did read on Dr. Mercola's site. And um, one of the write-ups, Sophia, says that 
Many buy into the conventional belief that lower cholesterol equals a lower risk of heart disease, but this is not always the case. And in fact, high cholesterol levels are indeed protective in some cases, whereas low cholesterol levels are very clearly linked to chronic disease. So I guess the point I'm trying to make here, you and I are not advocating one thing or another. We're just putting information out there, you know, based upon our research and giving our opinion. So this is not medical advice. But not until we had the pre-call for this interview here did I really sit down and take a look at this. And it's just another example in my mind where there's no discussion with regard to uh, what the side effects or the downside is to these drugs. Nobody really ever discusses that. You know, I guess it's up to the, the patient, you know, to read the, the label, if you will, but the doctor never talks about this. I'm going to read from the Senef article. This essay will develop an argument for why, over time, a statin user may become increasingly weak, in some cases to the point of major disability. A key message is that muscles are forced to cannibalize themselves to acquire sufficient energy. Another factor is oxidative damage to muscle tissue with subsequent disintegration of the cell walls. This is true not only for the skeletal muscles, but also for the respiratory muscles controlling breathing and the heart muscle. With continued abuse, the muscle cells disintegrate and the debris travels in the bloodstream to the kidneys, which can lead to kidney failure. So the pharmaceutical in industry, it minimizes how many people report myalgia. It says it's about 2%. But Senef says the observational studies have shown at least 10, if not 15%, people complaining of muscle pain. But the actual real number of these people is much, much higher. Because the thing is, People who are taking statins are generally older and they're just writing off this statin damage, this pa these pain signals they're getting to aging. Yeah. And the shortness of breath. Oh, I'm just getting older, right? Yeah, this is unbelievable. Uh, you know, it really is depressing when you start to really dig into this stuff and you see how people are being attended to from a medical perspective. I and mean, it's very disheartening. I took material from that very long Senef article, which I hope you'll link because it's so worth reading. It's going to take a little time, but it's definitely worth reading and trying to understand. But here's my synopsis of it. The article is a long one, but in short, muscles need a lot of energy to contract, to move our limbs and transport our body weight. They have primary and secondary ways of getting the energy to do this as their workload ranges from mild to extreme. Oxygen-based energy production, called respiration, occurs in the cell's nucleus, remember the egg yolk, where glucose and fatty acids are broken down to produce ATP, the actual fuel used by the cell. When oxygen is in short supply, the cell can make energy in the cytoplasm, the white of the egg, breaking down glucose with special enzymes. This is a process called fermentation. Fermentation, or anaerobic energy production, is what muscles rely on when under duress, when their oxygen doesn't come in fast enough. And there are, of course, gradients of duress. Some are voluntary, mild aerobic exercise. Some are more extreme. Starvation, for instance, is a gradient of duress that's very extreme. So extreme exercise or extreme power and strength requirements call on the muscles to pick from a range of glucose slash enzyme activities involving other major organs in the body, the heart and the liver. It's very complex and very remarkable, but let's just say that we have an arsenal of if not this, then that available to the muscles. So the muscles have a hierarchy. When things are doable, they use respiration. If their demands are much harder and higher, they go to fermentation. OK, making energy in the cytoplasm from sugar. But if our cell walls are broken and we're short of enzymes, meaning the enzymes are flooding out, this, none of the methods are going to work. Myoglobin is a protein that holds and transports oxygen within the cell, buffering it when it becomes dangerous because oxygen is tricky. It's um, not only corrosive, but there are other agents like free radicals who like to bond with oxygen. 
So when the cell walls crash and myoglobin flows out, there's no taxi to take the oxygen to the nucleus, and therefore there's no aerobic respiration. Without enough enzymes, the cell can't perform anaerobic fermentation either, because it needs enzymes to break down the glucose. So when fermentation fails, the anaerobic energy production in the cytoplasm, muscle cells can actually take their own proteins, ship them to the liver, which uses them to generate glucose, and that goes right back to the muscles. So this is what I mean when it, we have this descending order of you know, possibility. When things get harder and weirder and more and more uh, demand, tricky, they can actually cannibalize themselves. Muscles will take their own proteins and make energy out of those in the liver and then get them back. So this is the last resort sacrifice, this cannibalization, that it might give you the strength to keep going if you're lost in the wilderness. Your muscles will actually consume themselves, but that could get you back to civilization, right? Yeah. It's just so weird to me. Like <laughs> this whole thing where you would push yourself to such a point that you could conceivably hit the point of no return. In other words, you could damage your body so badly that there is no recovery. Right. So what do you think? And I know I'm digressing a little bit here because this is really very strange to me because I can't imagine somebody going out and knowingly looking to damage themselves, you know, or to, to hurt themselves physically or mentally. It even gets more weird when it's under the guise of fitness, pushing yourself to such a limit. As an example, in your newsletter on page three, you mentioned that this is not uh, about exercise or sport in a sense of perfecting a tennis game or jogging a little to get your heart rate up. It's designed to build your will, yeah. to teach you how to push to some untested point that will someday get you through something you wouldn't have been able to deal with before. But I mean, what is that something that do you think that you're preparing for if you're engaged in this type of um, activity? Well, Glassman says that CrossFit preps people for... <laughs> the unknown. Uh, he calls physical preparedness something that you would need. This is a direct quote from him. For getting ready for war, getting ready for earthquake, getting ready for mugging, getting ready for the horrible news that you have leukemia. So somehow he is equating the ability to push through pain into fermentation, into self-consumption of the muscles as a way to Harden yourself for this future that might possibly have these devastating events in it and that this will make you tough enough. Well, I'll tell you something, Mike. After I ran that marathon that I didn't train for because I, I mean, I could run 10 miles easily, 12 miles. I ran, you know, 17 miles one day and I didn't do the proper training that months and months and months of very systematic training to get this distance under your belt that you would have no trouble with. So I had terrible trouble after that marathon. I had horrible depression. I had not just soreness, but outright injuries. I was going nuts. I was in my 20s and I was losing it. And it was all because of physical exhaustion. And it went out for months. It went on for months. I was in a very bad physical state and even a mental state. And I'll tell you something, if I had found myself in a war or an earthquake at that point, I would have been mush. Yeah, it would have been of no benefit. <laughs> exactly. So I think that this idea, America, it comes from the reality shows on TV. People really want to make themselves as tough as possible. And to them, it's done in a gym. And this group mentality where you've got a trainer barking orders at you in these group settings, group training settings, which are going on in every gym now. There's the 24-hour fitness has the Ignite team training. This all is spawned by CrossFit, but CrossFit is its own very elite brand. And the people who go to CrossFit, they are the toughest. And I admire them. And I think the only way you might push into those realms of total depletion where your muscles go down the list, they break every kind of rule they know, and they have these more and more intense 
methodologies to get energy because they're doing it in a situation of life or death. You can consume yourself in a situation that you're either going to live or die because that's what it takes, but not in a gym. And the only reason people do it in these gyms is because they're in a setting which there's a whip cracking and it's a mental whip. And, you know, I, I fear the day when we have a lot of rhabdo survivors in wheelchairs saying, I survived rhabdo and this was the workout that did it to me. Yeah, and be proud of the fact that it puts you into this state. It is something that you need to that you need to put on your mantle as a, a trophy. It's very, very weird. As you were speaking, Sophia, I was thinking to myself, I wonder if it, in these gyms where they, they have these types of uh, workouts, if they actually have some kind of uh, disclosure or at least some kind of orientation for people who are going to undertake this type of exercise to let them know, look, if you take this to the extreme, you could be damaging yourself for life. I don't know. I don't even know if you have an answer for that, but I'm just thinking, I just, I guess what I'm struggling with is how do these gyms get away with this? How, how do they get away with uh, marketing and advertising something that is clearly propagating a health hazard? And it could be a very, very severe health hazard. Well, it's really in the hands of the user. I mean, CrossFit is one of those gyms that has equipment to do a lot of intense training. And it's, I guess you could say its mantra is to train intensely so that you perfect your fitness in many different areas. I'm trying to think, see where I wrote them all down. Here it is. The defining characteristic of CrossFit is the intensity. The programs are hard as hell. Its prescription, as the guide states, is for constantly varied, high-intensity, functional movements that will optimize physical competence in 10 physical domains, cardiovascular and respiratory endurance, stamina, strength, flexibility, power, speed, coordination, agility, balance, and accuracy. So these are 10 areas where people want to excel. And they're in a group setting, they're working with a partner. To me, that's the key. You have to be in the culture in order to not heed your body's signals of extreme and acute distress. Listen, Mike, I am 57 years old and I ignored warning signs when I was younger. I was on a 10 mile run one day and I wasn't used to running 10 miles at that time. And I just went trotting off and then I turned around and I had to run five miles back. And somewhere two miles short of returning back to where I started, this thing went off in my knee. It was like twang and it was painful. Well, I had two miles to go. I had nobody to call. I was in college, so nobody had a car anyway. And I didn't have a dime on me. It was in the days when you didn't carry cell phones. And I had to run home two miles and my leg, my knee got worse and worse and worse and worse. And I was limping by the time I returned. And you know what? I couldn't run for the next two months. I had to walk. I took six mile walks, which took a long time and weren't nearly as much fun. But today, if I had that kind of twinge, I'd quit. I'd run a few more steps. I could feel it getting worse. And I would say, that's it. You're going to walk. Hit your ride, but don't run on this. Part of that is experience. And so what I don't understand, and I wrote to a guy who had posted on CrossFit, he's a bodybuilder. He never answered me. I asked the question, what is it that makes people disregard the pains and the twinges that signal that something is failing? To, in my body, it's usually a tendon. The tendon is the end of the muscle. It's this very tough, thinner part of the muscle in terms of its width, but it, it's what grows into the bone. And when the muscle just contracts and contracts and contracts and contracts to the point of exhaustion, that tendon, it's going to go. It's going to start breaking, tearing. And that's my body. I would never even get to rhabdo because one of my tendon connections would go. That's the whole mind over body 
rationalization. I think a lot of these these folks go through these people that into these extreme workouts. Like I I had heard of CrossFit and all that stuff, but I just had no idea until you wrote this newsletter how intense it was. The old saying in the gym, no pain, no gain. I never bought into that. You know, if your body hurts, if you're doing something in the gym and your body hurts, stop doing it. And I know guys, friends of mine that were into bodybuilding, Sophia, and I would get some pain because I was in the gym and I would stop. And they're like, oh, you're not tough. You got to keep going. I'm like, keep going. A lot of these guys, they wound up having damaged uh, joints, ligaments for a very long time or even for life. Right. Or you'll get a chronic injury because I want to also get into my inflammation discussion because this is so important. And I had a friend, she's a nutritionist. She's very wise. She's an older woman. And she knows her stuff. And she sent me this little post somewhere from the internet on inflammation. And I will send it to you. But the short of it is this. Inflammation is the body's response to injury. So when an area is ailing, it could be an organ. It could be tissues in an area. You could have sprained your ankle or something, fallen down, gotten a bump. They say that inflammation causes disease. Well, they're wrong. Inflammation accompanies disease because it's a necessary uh, step for the body to begin repairs. So inflammation is the body's way of opening up tissues, just widening all the transport channels for blood, nutrient, oxygen, uh, wastes to be taken out, lymph to start detox, to remove all the excess proteins and the and the blood will bring the uh, fibroblasts and all the precursors to cell repair. So it, the tissues are wide open. The area is big. It's puffed up. And it often gets hot because the body is saying, all right, I'm going to elevate the temperature here just in case there's a wound and there's influx of bacteria. Bacteria don't do well with heat. That's why an area in your body will heat up. So what do coaches and trainers and doctors tell us they tell us ice ice elevate compress ice compress elevate ice and take painkillers and anti-inflammatories so why would you want to elevate a sprained ankle which your body has puffed up nicely in order to open up those transport channels why would you want to elevate it to drain all the blood out number two why would you want to put ice on it freezing and constricting those tissues that are nice and big and puffy for the repairs to start. Why would you want to ice that? Why would you want to compress, put a tight brace or bandage, tight ace bandage, wrap it up, pour it, they tell you. Why do you want to push all that tissue closed, right? And then why would you take anti-inflammatories that are drugs that constrict the tissues? The body has told you it rigidifies that area too. It makes it stiff. It makes it hard to use and painful. What is it telling you? It's telling you, don't use this ankle. I'm fixing it. I took a first aid course back in college. You know, uh, that's been around for God knows how long. And, and, and people are still doing that. It's coming around now where some doctors uh, are saying that that's not the way to go. But still the vast majority of them are doing exactly what you said that they're making folks do and it's counterproductive to what the body is trying to do to get you get you healed right i put a post up on prostate resection mike on my mm -hmm. blog sophiasmallstorm.com because i was just so horrified oh yeah 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 i've been reading a book by a woman who went to medical school and she subsequently she got her md but she didn't practice uh, orthodox medicine she practiced only natural medicine and the, in this book, she writes about the trials and tribulations of med school. And she explains on her various rotations when she's in the last two years doing clinical stuff, the different wards and departments and the way that, the things that they do to people. So we've all heard that men, as they age, can develop an enlarged prostate, right? Right. The prostate is a gland that is part of the male reproductive system. It makes this I don't, I could not even find the name for this fluid, but a milky white fluid that makes up the 30% of semen is made by the prostate, this 
milky substrate in which the sperm uh, are carried. So the prostate can enlarge as men get older. And they tell you it's normal. It's just very common. And it's part, partly there's a hereditary cofactor, you know. And they send you in for a prostate resection. This is a procedure they call it minimally invasive. They pat themselves on the back for that. But what is it? The prostate resection, I mention this word to people now and they all say, oh, my dad had that, or yeah, my uncle had, or my brother had that. Oh, these people go in and they, this, I guess they're urologists or surgeons, and they, they shave that prostate down in size. Yep, so yep. why is the prostate enlarged? Let me explain something here. It's enlarged because it's inflamed. They don't tell you it's inflamed because it's not doing well. And it's become puffed and bigger so repairs can take place in it. It's, it's missing nutrients. Iodine is one of the nutrients that is missing in lots of people and it causes enlarged prostates. So iodine deficiency, any number of things. But the prostate is swollen. That's an enlarged prostate. It's an inflamed prostate. It's sick. It's hurting. It's ailing. And the medical world goes in and shaves it, makes it smaller, cuts it down. And they do this by burning the tissue, cauterizing it. Now that you have a smaller prostate in the man, they fixed it. Now it's not going to press on his bladder and cause him to have to go to the bathroom all the time. The question becomes, though, what, what does that do internally when you shave the prostate down? You're actually altering this part of the body, this organ. So I wonder if they even know what that means from a, a functionality perspective from that point forward. Yeah, it, it's not going to do its job. Ejaculation issues, um, more pain, more discomfort, blood in the urine. I mean, the side effects of prostate surgery They'll tell you, oh, it takes a while to normalize. But the fact is, you've just whittled down a gland that was asking for help. You've actually cut it and made it smaller so it fits in the space it's supposed to fit in. That makes no sense to me. Sorry. No, you know, it's interesting not to get too personal with my own story here, but about, I guess, over 10 years ago, a decade ago, there were some issues that I was experiencing with the prostate. And so I went to the doctor and, you know, they gave me this medication. It was Flomax. And Sophia, I was on that Flomax for about four days before I couldn't function. I was completely disoriented. I couldn't hold a thought in my head. I remember at that time I was, I was at work. I was on a business trip. I was up in uh, Connecticut at the time. And of course, I'm trying to get ready for a big presentation. That's the reason why I was up there. And I'm telling you, I could not get my thoughts put together. So I realized that, you know what, it's this drug. And so I called my doctor from Connecticut. I live in North Carolina. And I said to him, hey, look, I'm having the following symptoms and this is not good. He says, stop taking it immediately. So I did. Now, what I started doing, and this goes back to when I really started getting into more into herbs and supplements and stuff like that. I did my research and I started taking salt palmetto and I was on the salt palmetto for about a week and all of the problems or issues that I was experiencing with the prostate completely went away. Now that's my personal story. So I'm not sitting here saying that's going to work for everybody that way, but I do know that it works for a lot of guys because when I went to my urologist for a checkup and I had mentioned to him that the flow max is out, I, I can't take this stuff. I had very bad side effects from it and that I switched to the salt palmetto. To this urologist's credit, he said, continue to stay on it. He says, because he said, uh, it works as well as any of the prescription drugs that they are uh, handing out to, to the guys. He said, so stay on it as long as it works. And he says, and it should work a long time. And I have never been off it and never had any such issues again since I was on the salt palmetto. So it's saw, S-A-W, Paul? S-A-W, yep. Palmetto, P-A-L-M-E-T-T-O. And guys, if you are listening to this, you want to get the standardized version of it, which means it's um, it doesn't have a whole bunch of crap and additives added to the uh, to the supplement. But anyway, I wanted to throw that in there because you know it's just another situation where you know the first inclination is just to hand out drugs. It's like the whole discussion we had about with the statin drugs. 
Yeah. It's their knee-jerk reaction. Here, take this. And, so it's um, the extract of the fruit of Saranoa repens. I don't know what that is. It's rich in fatty acids and phytosterols. It's been used in traditional and alternative medicine to treat a variety of conditions, most notably benign pro prostatic hyperplasia, which is the inflamed prostate. Right. So yeah, it's commonly used and people really like it. Now, I'll tell you a story. I had a friend who uh, didn't tell me that he had a frequent urination problem. He was in his 50s, but he wanted to try iodine. So I let him um, have a quarter ounce bottle, the little trial size. And a few days later, he told me it was amazing. And I said, why? And he said, well, for one thing, it has stopped my frequent urination. I said, really? And uh, this is all reproductive gland issue, the prostate being inflamed because it's a reproductive gland. So I guess the iodine, he was only taking one drop. I said, how much are you taking? He said, one drop. I said, really? He's six foot four. I said, my, you're not going past. He said, no, I'm going to stick with one drop. And usually you start with the one drop and you work up right. to whatever your desired favorite level is. But you have to tr go up slowly. So he stuck with the one drop and he said he had spent thousands and thousands of dollars trying to go to urologists and get some something done for his uh, frequent urination and this first drop of iodine he ever took uh, apparently solved the problem for him. So that to me was a, an astonishing story. And again, I don't know the difference between saw palmetto and iodine, the effect on the prostate, but here are two things that evidently in two instances have worked very well. To possibly help, yeah. Yeah. And it's not expensive. Yeah, exactly. I have a story for you too, if you don't mind. No. Go back to Rabdo for a second. People will probably think, God, this guy wants to talk about that a lot. <laughs> but um, I mentioned to you before we got started here that uh, I had a little issue over the, the weekend where I had a, I wound up going to the urgent care after waiting a couple of days, I probably shouldn't have waited, but you know, that's me. But in any case, uh, big tree had fallen down in my yard, a uh, storm had blew in. And so the next day I was out at nine o'clock in the morning. I, like I mentioned, I live in North Carolina and it was warm. It was 80 degrees already by 9 a.m. So I was out there with my chainsaw and I'm going to take this tree down, you know, cut it up and drag it out to the front where the town will take it. And so Sophia, what happened was I'm out there and, um, so the temperature went from 80 degrees to 91 within two hours. I was out there between 9 and 11. And I did take water breaks every once in a while. You know, I'm not, not dumb. I knew, I knew that I had to hydrate myself, but evidently I didn't do it enough. So what had happened was uh, when it was pushing around 11 a.m. and I was dragging these very large limbs by myself, I was literally, I would use the chainsaw, cut the limb. It was a very big tree, so some of these limbs are very large, and so I would drag them from the backyard all the way to the front. So I got to the point where I was dragging one of these limbs, and I literally had to stop it because I was out of breath, and I was fatigued, and I started getting pressure in my chest. And so I listened to my body, and my body was basically saying, you need to stop, like right now. So I just stopped and I went inside, had a bottle of water and uh, I decided I have to relax the rest of the day. But what had happened was from Friday, Saturday, Sunday into yesterday, my body was not reacting properly. I was getting these little twinges in my body. I was getting them near my heart area, the sternum, the right hand side, right hand side of my body, my shoulder blades. I was getting like a tingling sensation in my forearms and so on. So I started to get a bit concerned because I thought to myself, you know, maybe there was like a, a minor stroke or maybe uh, I, I did put, I taxed my heart too much. And I do try to take care of myself because like you, I'm 57 years old also. And I, I do work out. Um, I try to watch what I eat. I, I try to do all the right things. I try to stay very healthy. But, you know, you reach a certain age not to say you're old, but you know you can't be doing things at 57 that you used to do at 37 or 27, right? So anyway, long story short is yesterday I decided, okay, enough is enough. I need to go get it checked out. And I'm not a big fan of running to the doctor. That's another problem that I have. <laughs> and so I get there and uh, they check things out. EKG, they did um, 
uh, an X-ray of the uh, chest area, and they had um, they did a urine test. And the reason why they did the urine test is they wanted to make sure I didn't have rhabdo. And the doctor specifically mentioned that to me. She said to me that uh, you would be amazed at how many people come into this office on these hot summer days down here in North Carolina, and they push their body past the limit, and they wind up with rhabdomyolysis. Wow. It's more common than we think, and it doesn't just come out of the gym world. Even if you're doing things outside of the gym or you're not doing any kind of that extreme type of exercise, if you're working out in your yard, and uh, especially if it's very hot, and you push and push and push, the same thing could happen. And the doctor said the same thing that you had said, that I guess there's certain... Um, ranges of rhabdomyolysis that you can have. I mean, you can have something that's, you know, it's minor and you can have acute. If it gets to the point though, where it's acute, you will not recover. It's not recoverable at a certain point. Right. So it all depends on the demands you're placing on the muscles. And there is the systemic rhabdo, which is what the statin drugs give you because they cause the failure of the cell walls in the muscle cells because they shoot out the cholesterol, and that is a system-wide, it's in all your muscles, and that leads to the myalgia and the pain, which people don't understand is caused by the drugs they're taking, by this particular condition that's starting to spread. But then there's the what they call local rhabdo, which comes from overuse of a particular muscle group, and that ends up being systemic as well because that myoglobin is flowing throughout your body. It's in your blood and it's definitely going to wind up in the kidneys and destroy the tubules in the kidneys. But again, Glassman is now worth hundreds of millions of dollars. He's got the fastest growing gym in the universe. He's flanked by 80 lawyers and they have not lost a lawsuit. They've had rhabdo lawsuits. But once again, I have to say it's the user. It's the user who needs to pay attention to his or her own body. And this group, this culture um, that you get sucked into. Okay, so there's a gym here that used to be called Seal Fit. And it was created by some Navy SEALs, ex-Navy SEALs. And I would see the Seal Fit guys on the beach. And these people dressed in camo. And they would have backpacks and they would be doing push-ups and different kinds of beach workouts. And I heard the trainer screaming at them one day. First, I thought it was the real SEALs, that the military was coming to the beach and working out, which they occasionally do. But they usually do it up in Oceanside at Camp Pendleton, uh, not in Del Mar and Cardiff and the areas of the beach that I go to. So here I am. I'm watching these guys. And the trainer is saying to them, come on, get some sand in your ears, come on. And I'm thinking, <laughs> get some sand in your ears? This is not the military. This oh, is something boy. else. And sure enough, they were rubbing their heads in the sand and trying to get sand in their ears to give themselves the extreme discomfort of an extreme workout, right? Well, Seal Fit has become CrossFit now, of course. Again, I'm, I'm going to take Glassman's side for a minute. CrossFit has its different levels of workouts. It's got a pregnant women's workout, it's got a workout for the elderly, the overweight, and then it's got the SEAL workout. So what does Glassman say? He says, no SEAL is going to do the fat people's workout, but the fat people will do the SEAL workout, just to try it, right? Well, oh, by the way, you have to be a complete moron to stick your head in the sand and <laughs> be getting sand in your ears and trying to invoke discomfort. I'm sorry. Oh, you wouldn't do that, Mike? I know. I wouldn't do that. You know, you're telling that story, and I'm, I'm getting this visual of people like rubbing their head in the sand, you know, and Rah! you know, I'm going to be a tough guy, whatever it may be. And it's it's moronic. I'm sorry. Look, if you're into one of these fitness programs and you're doing that and you're hearing me and you're insulted, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> it just doesn't seem very intelligent to me. Well, then you could get some in your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, I have been buried in the sand by a friend as an adult. I see kids doing this all the time to each other. A kid will put another kid, pile sand on him, dig a hole, and it's a very interesting experience. But 
you do go home with sand in all the cracks and crevices of your body, and it remains there for many days. Right. And um, I did see some kids on the beach the other day. They had buried their dog. Its oh. head was sticking out. No, it loved it. It was a hot day. Okay. And it was very happy. And it was buried up to the neck. I'll tell you, that was a strange sight to see this dog with its head out, just kind of looking. But um, they released it after a, a short amount of time. But So, yeah, that's something you probably would never do is bury yourself in the sand or have yourself buried. But these are, you know, they're outdoor experiences. I think the CrossFit thing goes back to being a wild child. And you just want to do something as long and as much as possible. But the thing is, I still don't understand how you can ignore your body signals of distress and end up losing, losing an entire muscle system. Yeah, that's my point. My point is, is that you're doing ex it's so extreme that you're all caught up in it. And uh, look, I'm hoping that people who are involved in these type of exercise regiments are listening to this show and at least put a little bug in your head just a little voice that says you know what i need to be careful because maybe you didn't even know what rhabdomyolysis was you know but now if you listen to the show you will mike i'm going to tell a story i was working at a law firm which was dissolving many years ago and they offered me some uh, ceramic pots for plants so I took a small one, and then I also chose a very large one. And this large one was large. Now picture all ceramic at least 18 inches wide and 18 inches or 20 inches high. A big pot, right? A circle. And I put the small one in the large one, and I took the elevator down to the street. And I had to go a few blocks to the parking lot where my car was parked. And I was carrying this, these two pots in my two arms. And oh my God, I went from respiration into fermentation very quickly. And I didn't know if I was going to make it, but I didn't want to have to drop the pot and break it. Or I don't know why I didn't think about resting because all you have to do is rest in between fermentation. You can do fermentation for a few minutes and then you rest and you give yourselves a chance to recover and then you pick the thing up again and you carry it a little farther well no 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 i had to get to my car without putting this thing down and i seriously thought i was going to pass out my arms worked harder than they had ever worked in their lives in my life and i made it and they were jelly afterwards yep, just yep. throbbing and shaking i could barely hold the steering wheel to drive that's an instance when I'm not in a team, but I have a goal. I want to make it to my car. I don't want to put this thing down. Let's see if I can carry it the whole way, right? Yeah, and I'm sure a lot of people have experienced that, carrying stuff maybe, you know, out of their local hardware store like the Home Depot or whatever. I don't care what age you are. In fact, as you're telling that story, I'm, I'm remembering times when I've had a similar type of experience. You know, I just didn't put it down. I got to keep going, got to keep going, got to keep going. And then by the time I reach my destination, you're right. Like your arms feel like they're just flopping around. I know. You know? So now we know better. Put it down. Just put it down. Put it down. Take a rest. <laughs> oh, Sophia, this has been a, really a great conversation. It, it really has been. I like these conversations because we could just go off and talk about whatever we want to talk about. And it's always interesting stuff. You're um your newsletter is always well-researched, and it's always very interesting. Well, I like doing it. It's just a way for me to really go deep into a subject and write it all down. And If people want to read more newsletters, I need to post a few from this recent year, but I'm in my sixth year. It's called the Avatar Update on my website, aboutthesky.com. It's under the newsletter tab, and there are some samples there from the various years. I think I'm going to put this Rabdo one up as well. And um, you can subscribe. There's instructions at the top of the page. So you would have to subscribe to it. And not everybody wants to do that. So I don't blame you. But I am starting to do more radio shows about the newsletter. So you're going to get the content that way if you, if you want it. Hey, do you have any new products on your um, avatar site? There's a magnesium lotion coming soon. Um, the magnesium cream is always a very good product to use um, 
it, when you have muscle soreness, it relaxes muscles. It stops the uh, pain very quickly. Like when you get so, rhabdo? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, you I'm need teasing. magnesium. It's extremely important, but I don't know how much magnesium you would need for rhabdo. Probably, I don't know if it could save you. That would actually be interesting. I want people to try the hippie charcoal soap, the black charcoal soap. It's very good. And the lotion is very good also on that page. People, are they bypass that because there's so much soap and there's so much lotion in the world. But what I've learned is I learned it from the people who make this stuff, particularly the lotion. When you go to the drugstore or somewhere and you buy lotion for $5, for a nice eight ounce or whatever, you're really buying water and glycerin. You're buying filler. The quality products, the real moisturizing products, the oils, the expensive things are thinned out. And so that's the lotion you would have to apply several times a day. You put it on your arms and you notice two hours later, your arm is looking peely again, you know, flaky. So you have to reapply. So you use it a lot faster, but you have that satisfaction that it's a great price. So this lotion that I brought in, it's truly amazing. Amazing. You only have to put it on once a day. So it's the olive oil lotion. And I have to say, if I put something on my website, it means it's amazing. That's all. And the URL is avatarproducts.com? Yes, that's my store, right? avatarproducts.com, and you can access the store from aboutthesky.com. And, oh, I have the 18X um, Himalayan Soap Berry Concentrate, which I've been using in the wash. And my wash is coming out so utterly clean because I'm doing something that no one's ever done before, I'm told, by the maker of the Himalayan Soap Berry Extract. So Himalayan Soap Berries are the fruit of the Sapindus mucarosi tree. By the way, the uh, saw palmetto, the Saranoa repens, is a palm tree, a short one that grows in the southeastern United States. But anyway, Sapindus mucarosi grows in the Himalayas, the foothills, and it has the highest uh, surfactant content. Surfactant is a slippery substance that actually removes dirt and oil from other things like clothes. So the ancients did laundry too. And these soap nuts or soap berries, when you throw a little uh, sack of five or six into your washing machine, not only do they clean your clothes better than detergent, but they don't leave any residue and they don't, your clothes smell wonderful. But what I started to do was combine a cap full of the liquid extract and the soap berries and my wash is coming out so clean, I can't believe it. So I'm very excited about the combination. And then the other thing that I did I went on a cleaning spree. I am cleaning like a maniac. Blinds, whatever, whatever I can see, I'm cleaning it, washing it. And I used the Himalayan soap nut extract to clean blinds. I used way too much in the beginning. And I found out really how much this can be diluted and how well it works. So I have to take my hat off to the company that makes this. It's the 18X soap berry liquid. And you can use it in your wash, you can dilute it, you can wash your carpets, pets, blinds, whatever. But it, it's really good. How do you dilute it? What are you doing? Well, what I did was I took a bucket and I poured a capful in and I made, you know, a three inches high worth of water. Well, that was way too much. I had to dilute that more and more and more because it kept bubbling. And when I saw bubbles, I knew that it was rich in surfactant. So I wanted to get it much more watery. So that's, you just dilute it by your sense, but you're going to start out way too strong. Just remember, use a tiny amount. I also do hand wash with it. I just do a teeny drop in a sink full of uh, water. And that's it. And you don't need rinsing. You don't need to waste water and rinse what you're washing. You can just do a drop or two in the sink, and then when you drain the water out, there's no residue, so it's gone. You only have to clean it once. You have and a lot of great products. And by the way, you know, uh, Sophia, so the folks know, your pricing is great for the types of products that you're selling. Yeah, I try to keep the price as low as possible. I just want to be very fair to people, and I want them to have a really good experience. 
So I think argan oil is a good product too. If you want to put that on, it's very, very nourishing to the skin. All you need are a couple of drops and you can do all your sunburn, dried out, summery, leathery skin with that. It's from Morocco, argan oil. And I actually get it from a Moroccan guy and it comes straight from uh, some Berber women in Morocco who hand crack the nuts we have to be very kind to our bodies, but not baby them. Greg Glassman doesn't want you to do a namby-pamby Zumba dancing class or a cheesy bike ride. He wants you to push, but not too extremes, all right? Right. So, no, we have to take care of our bodies. Sophia, I know that uh, you forgot to run, and again, it was a great show. Thank you. Till next time. Till next time. <laughs> See ya. And that concludes another Sage of Quay interview, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Links to my guests' websites and social media are listed in the show notes below. And as always, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog. You can get to the blog by typing in sageofquayradio.blogspot.com or simply head over to our hub website at sageofquay.com. Also, if you get a moment, please visit laboroflovemusic.com to listen to my album, Leaving Dystopia. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone next week. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless. Telling me it's time to breathe